Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Jack Daly, the John and Adrian Mars Director of the Smithsonian's National Air and Space Museum, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to tonight's General Electric Aviation Lecture. This is the museum's longest-running sponsored program. Since 1982, we've presented more than 140 lectures from some of the biggest names in modern aviation history. Like all of our public programs, this lecture is offered free of charge. This is only possible thanks to the generous support of General Electric Aviation. Private contributions are critical to our programs and exhibitions, and it's my privilege to acknowledge their long-standing, valued sponsorship. Representing General, Aviation, Gen General Electric Aviation in the audience tonight are Ms. Darby Becker and Mr. Paul Hughes. Would you stand and be recognized? Thank you. We thank you for your continuing support. Uh, since we opened here in 1976 and in Chantilly in 2003, more than 340 million people have walked through our doors to be inspired by the transformative history of flight. And just this summer, we celebrated our 40th birthday by transforming one of the world's great public spaces, the Boeing Milestones of Flight Hall, just outside this theater. Our newly renovated main gallery is the centerpiece of what will be a complete revitalization of this building inside and out. And we're going to stay open the entire time. So tell your friends. It may look like we're, we've demolished the building, but we're going to be in here and ready for you. With help from our partners like GE Aviation, we will be ready to inspire new generations of visitors for decades to come. This July marked another milestone in aviation history when Boeing celebrated its 100th anniversary. In more than 40 years with the company, tonight's speaker has seen much of that history firsthand and has made aviation history herself time and again. Susanna Darcy Henneman joined Boeing as an engineer in 1974. Now th listen to what I'm saying here. This is, for all of you pilots, you'll see what I'm talking about. After learning to fly with the company's Employee Flying Association and a stint as a ground school instructor, she became Boeing's first female test pilot. This marked the beginning of a career in the cockpit that broke barriers and set records that stand to this day. Susanna earned a captain's rating in the 747-400 in 1989 and achieved captain's status in the 737, 757, and 767 as well. She served as chief pilot on the 777 program, responsible for flight testing all models of the world's largest twin-engine jet. It was in a 777 world liner that she made history once again when she commanded a crew of seven additional pilots in nonstop flight from Hong Kong to London in 2005. That 22-hour, 22-minute flight shattered the world record for distance flown by a commercial aircraft. As you can see, she has covered a lot of ground in her career and even set some speed records along the way. As chief pilot for, service for, flight, as chief pilot for flight services, Susanna was responsible for flight and cabin crew training all, at all the Boeing campuses worldwide. She's a member of the Society of Experimental Test Pilots and is honored in the Women in Aviation Hall of Fame. She's a frequent lecturer in prestigious aviation forums around the world from Seattle to London and once before in this very theater. She may even tell us something about that tonight. The, uh, we're honored to have her back to reflect on a truly extraordinary career in aviation as a trailblazer. It's now my pleasure to welcome the recently retired Chief Pilot for Boeing Flight Services, Captain Susanna Tarsi, Darcy Henneman. Susanna. Thank you. Good evening. General Daly, thank you for the very kind introduction and I would like to thank the National Air and Space Museum as well as General Electric uh, for inviting me to be tonight's speaker. And as General Daly said, it was about 20 some years ago I was fortunate enough to speak here. It was at the beginning of my 777 career and now I'm on the very end of my 777 career. So talk about a great bookend uh, to mark in your life. So thank you to both of you for that. 
So the adventure of going from a three-year-old who, who told her grandmother that she was going to learn to fly and would become a pilot definitely was, I think, the best e-ticket ride ever. So I went from being a three-year-old uh, to saying I was going to fly. I was very lucky to have grandparents who didn't think that was at all strange. And so the great thing about my grandparents was they believed if you were willing to set your goals and pursue them with a single-minded purpose, you could achieve anything. And it didn't matter whether a woman had never done it before or if no one had ever done it before. You just needed to focus on your goal and go for it and you could do it. So I think that was the biggest support I had uh, during my upbringing. So I'll tell you a little bit about my career and I'll also use the 777-200LR or long range airplane tonight to show you a little bit about flight testing and you'll go for a ride with me in the flight deck and I'll show you some flight test footage and at the end I'm going to talk about our world record flight and I'll follow that with any questions that you'd like to ask. But I thought I would start the evening by answering the question I used to get asked the most frequently which went something like, what's a nice girl like you doing in a job like that? The answer is very easy. Uh, I think I came out of the womb wanting to fly. I, it, I can remember back to being very small and watching airplanes go overhead. We lived in Los Angeles. And the thing about, uh, you know, within my family history of telling my grandmother what I wanted to do. The, uh, I did have family that was involved in aviation. Again, my grandparents, my grandmothers bucked rivets. That was their war effort in Long Beach. And my grandfather worked on P-51 Mustangs. I think I also got something else from my grandmothers. Uh, they may have been bucking rivets, but they did so in great fashion. So I always wore earrings and lipstick when I went to work, no matter what the hour was. So I did get that from them. Have any of you read the book West with the Night by Beryl Markham. I see a few hands. So for those of you who aren't familiar with Ms. Markham, she was the first person to fly solo across the Atlantic from east to west. And she says best how I personally feel about flying. She says in her beautiful book, the air takes me into its realm. Night envelops me entirely, leaving me in touch leaving me out of touch with the earth, leaving me within the small moving world of my own, living in space with the stars. And speaking of her airplane, she says, to me she is alive and to me she speaks. And that's always how I felt when I flew that the airplane spoke to me, telling me what was working right and what needed to be adjusted. I've always said that flying is a little bit like falling in love. Uh, in the beginning, everything is perfect like this beautiful perfect day and then you know time goes by little things come up uh, maybe not so much for me in the Pacific Northwest you might have heard it rains a lot in Seattle and you're walking across the Everett flight line the wind starts blowing it's raining let me tell you it is one of the coldest places on earth you're trying to hold on to your coffee and your flight bag usually toss the coffee out on the ramp because the winds blowing so hard it won't stay in the cup so there were a few days like that I thought certainly I could make my living a lot easier than what I'm currently doing. However, then you have a perfect day, just like love, and you fall in love all over again. So this is one of my many perfect days in aviation, and it's the first flight of the 777-200LR. And we're about halfway through the flight. There are only two of us on board, me and one other pilot. And the two chase airplanes join up on you. Uh, he's quite far away at this point in time. When they're joined up, they're about four feet away. I can tell the color of the guy's eyes that's taken the, the pictures and you loop around Mount Rainier and you get these fabulous photos and then the guy who's uh, tucked up next to you slides out the other person slides in and uh, they take photos with the other airplane so the autopilot's on and we always said this is the time you take a big deep breath to appreciate how lucky you are to get to do something very pilots have the opportunity to do. So I think aviation, you'd all agree, is something that brings out the passion in us all, whether you're an observer, a pilot, a mechanic, an engineer, an air traffic controller. And the first video we're going to see tonight was about my former organization. And I think it really captures the passion of aviation.
So the next question I'm going to answer, although there'll be a couple of videos in between, is why would any sane person do 87 stalls in one day? Okay. So what we're going to see, I brought two pieces of flight test footage. One of them is stalls, and the other one is what's called VMCG, or the minimum maneuvering speed on the ground. So the first video we'll see is for stalls. And during initial airworthiness, as well as for certification, you demonstrate stalls in a jet. And how many of you have done stalls in airplanes? OK, and how many of you has it been in a jet? <laughs> nice, OK, all right. So we have one person who's going to check up on how truthful I am here. So. And the reason you do stalls, for those of you who haven't done them, is what you're looking at is the handling characteristics of the airplane, and as well as the data that you get is converted into the approach speeds that are used during landing. The stalls in a jet, you typically do between 10 and 20,000 feet. We'd start at 20,000 feet, do one, kind of waffle down, do another. We could get three or four in before you get down to 10,000 feet. That was our limit. You didn't want to get too low to the ground, just in case. And from entry to recovery, a stall in a Boeing jet uses up about 2,500 feet. So what you'll see in the first video, and I'll point it out, is the buffet on the wing. You're going to see the buffet start. So the wing's really going to start to move. And then the tail is really going to start to buffet. The elevator will come full up. The airplane stalls, so uh, for those of you who haven't done stalls, this is where the airflow is disturbed. It separates coming over the wing. You have no more lift. The airplane decides, I'm done flying. And she should nose over nice and straight, pick up some speed, lift again, and you start flying again. It's really easy. Okay. Now, the second test, uh, minimum maneuvering speed on the ground, or VMCG, we do for certification, and what you want to do is you want to establish the minimum speed on the ground that you can fly at. If you're slower than that, you have to stop. At that speed or above, you can go ahead and fly if you were to have an engine failure, okay? Now, what you'll see is, now you have to picture my office. This airplane is so well balanced. She looks beautiful, right? She's basically square, so she does not look as big as she is. So from wingtip to wingtip, Nose to tail, it's about the same dimension. But she is two-thirds the length of an American football field. So the next time your team plays and loses, I'm so sorry, to the Seahawks, you can think of the nose as on the Seahawks 15-yard line and the tail is on your 15-yard line. That's how big she is. And the fabulous uh, General Electric engines are so big around that you can take a 737 and slide the body through the engine and still have room around the sides. So she's a big baby, okay? So we're gonna get in the big baby. We're gonna accelerate down the runway. And the guy in the jump seat is gonna shut the engine down. I'm watching him very carefully to make sure he chooses the correct one. And the next thing that happens, uh, the engine's gonna be really cranky because it's been shut down at high power. It doesn't like that. And there's a big bang. And you can't twitch. You have to wait 0.5 to 0.7 seconds or the engineer will make you do it again. And, um, and what you're waiting time-wise, you want to see the nose start to move into the engine that you just shut down. Okay? So as soon as you see it twitch, you put in full opposite rudder. And here's really the part for the test that takes faith, coordination, and why we go to the simulator to do all these tests beforehand. So what you're waiting for is for the center of gravity in that two-thirds the length of an American football field to translate back across the center line. And I will tell you from the flight deck, you have no feeling for that. You are absolutely relying on your partner who's looking at the data in the back end. All right, so here goes the stall. So we're decelerating about one knot per second. You're just pulling the control column back, gently, gently. You start to see the wing buffeting. You really start to see the tail buffet. The elevator is coming all the way up. And you gently push over. Easy. And you start flying again. 
The only thing is the new kid, I will say what you see is all sky, all ground. All sky, all ground. And after a while, it's, gosh, this is a lot of fun. Okay, now, like I said, the second test is the VMCG testing. Okay, here's the acceleration. There's the engine shutdown. There's the rudder, and now we're going to wait. You want to know what the scariest job is? The photographer by the side of the <laughs> runway. So after I did this flight test, uh, we were training a new guy. And so I thought, well, I'll just go stand with her and take a look. And after the first one, I said, how the holy do you do this job? She says, oh, I've got a plan. You get too close to me, I'm throwing down the camera and I'm running for it. <laughs> So to answer the question is of why any sane person would do 87 stalls in one day. So we're actually out over the Mojave Desert, some mountains uh, near the Mojave Desert, and I was flying with my boss uh, in this airplane, and I heard him ask the engineer in the back, what is the record for the most number of stalls done in one day? Now I am thinking, dude, do not answer him. Do not answer him. <laughs> But the engineer, being a good, honest young guy, says very blithely to my boss, oh, I think it was about under 70, and I thought, oh, God, here we go. We're going to do at least 70. Now, what you have to think of in this airplane, too, is where the wing is is basically where the center of gravity is on the airplane, and that's where all the engineering stations are. So they don't care how many stalls you do because they're, it's like being in the middle of a teeter-totter. They're hardly moving at all. We, on the other hand, are a third of a football field away from the middle of that. And we are on the whip end. So all that stall buffet, 87 stalls later, if I could have crawled off the airplane, I would have been happy. And I will not discuss, which I did at Iowa, what part of my anatomy was in the greatest pain. But we'll just stop right there. My other story about stalls uh, is actually the original title of my talk is Why Test Pilots Don't Wear Pearls. Uh, I did not wear them uh, tonight uh, either. In fact, I did not wear jewelry after this particular incident on the airplane ever again. So what happened when you're the new kid? Uh, of course, the person that's training you tries to get you as much experience as possible. And the guy who was training me every day would send me off to fly with somebody I hadn't flown with before. So one day he says, I'm going to send you out to fly with so-and-so on a 6-7 and you're going to do stalls. I said, oh great, I've never seen stalls in a jet before. Done them in light airplanes, which is what my background was. I came up through general aviation, no problem. Because my assignment was, I quote my trainer, all you have to do is keep him out of trouble. Raise the gear, raise the flaps, talk on the radio, just keep him out of trouble. Seemed like a simple assignment. So, off we went, and we're in the 6-7. Now remember this is in the mid-80s. All the guys wore shirt and tie to work, and being the first woman, my equivalent was a blouse and $7 faux pearls from Nordstrom's. So what I missed as the new kid, uh, this was really my downfall in the adventure, was I was pretty nervous, so I didn't notice that the captain had his five-point harness basically biting into his skin. And mine was loose, so I could lean forward to raise the landing gear, lower the landing gear, raise the flaps, and talk on the radio. So we start into the first stall, and the first class galley is right behind the first officer. And I hear a little gentle clinking of the galley inserts, and we're buffeting a little bit, and we're buffeting a little bit more. And then like that video, we're buffeting a lot more and 110 pounds hits its resonant frequency, and I had a bigger do back in the day that was very chic. And my hair literally is sticking into the circuit breaker panel. Um, of course, like any new kid, I look over to see if the captain realizes what a fool he has for a first officer. He's not paying any attention to me. He's busy working. I'm trying to tighten down the harness. Of course, the controller talks to me, and you get a 
five-figure fine and a nice six-week unpaid vacation if you don't get on it and, and reply um, if you're violated and the faux pearls were hitting me in the face so I'm basically being beaten up by my own jewelry and I'm trying to stuff the necklace down my blouse so I get myself sorted out, we do a bunch more, I learn what I'm supposed to on the flight, we go back into the office, and the guy that I work for said to me, and he'd say this every day jokingly, well little girl, what did you learn today? And I said, today I learned test pilots don't wear pearls, and by default, if I ever write a book, that's got to be the title. <laughs> So we were in the middle of flight testing the 777-200LR when marketing came to us with an unexpected idea. It was something we had actually tried to convince marketing to do, but it was very expensive, so they kept telling us to go away, and you can't blame them, which was to set the record, the great circle distance record, in a heavyweight airplane. The airplane that had done it previously was back in 1989. It was a Qantas 747-400 that had gone from London to Sydney. And many a person had tried to break this record, and they had all failed. And we had sat down and plotted on paper and knew this airplane could do it. But we had to have somebody finance it. We would, the pilots would not own the money within the Boeing company. So the reason you'd say to yourself, why did marketing want you to do this? So we had been uh, accused is a strong word, but it had been said that the Boeing company basically had cooked our books on the performance for the 777 and that the performance of the airplane actually could not be what the book value said. And so this was to not only break the record, but to prove that the performance of the 777 was exactly what the Boeing company said. So if you recall, the Wright brothers actually set the first record for distance. They set it in 1905 on October 5th when Wilbur Wright um, registered with the NAA or the National Aeronautic Association here in Washington DC and he flew 24.5 miles in 38 minutes and 3 seconds. So for us this was you know not only doing the record which we'd had our eye on from our 4-7 compatriots but it was really sentimental for us because here we were a hundred years later not exactly to the date but very close also going for a distance record that would be registered with the NAA. So the decision was made to fly from Hong Kong to London, uh, the long way, please, not the wrong way. We were going to go eastbound, and I'll show you why. Um, and that's what we would do for a record flight. So I brought a video of the airplane, and um, she has a little story. So the airplane was the number two 777-200LR we used in flight test. And we weren't very happy that that airplane was chosen. The reason marketing wanted us to take the airplane is what you'll see is the interior is beautiful. It had this fantastic carpet. It had brand new seats. It had a bar. We never saw it. It had a bar. It had a Bose sound system that was so awesome that the first time the guys were watching Jurassic Park in the back, it literally shook the aisle stand in the front, and I thought we had some kind of vibration problem. It was a great Bose sound system. But the airplane had a reputation, and she had a nickname. And her nickname was the Spa Queen. And the reason we called her the Spa Queen, you cannot make up stories like this, is that she would fly along, and she wouldn't have one flight squawk, and then it was like she decided, I need the day off. And so an electronic message would uh, be thrown up that you had to ground the airplane for and fix that we had never seen on any other 777. We knew the message was there, we just never saw it before. And the airplane would take a day or two off, the message would go away, she'd fix herself. The mechanics would scratch their heads and just say, Susanna, what do you think's going on? I said, I don't know, I don't know. She breaks, she fixes herself, let's just go with it. But our concern was we were taking the Spa Queen to Hong Kong and would that be the day she decided, well, I'll just throw up a message, I'm going to take the day off and we wouldn't be able to do the record. So here she is in all of her glory.
There was also some flight test footage in there of flying in ground effect where you fly about 10 or 15 feet off the runway to see how the airplane handles. And also that uh, beautiful landing, even if I say so myself, sometimes you get lucky, uh, was not at sunset, that's at sunrise. Most of the flying we did down in the Mojave Desert, you started as soon as the sun came up because you have very still air and you get the best data when you do that. So the plan for the record flight was to go from, as I said, Hong Kong to London, over Taiwan, Japan, just south of the Aleutian Islands, into the US, to the East Coast, across the Atlantic, and into London. So our goal was to significantly smash the existing record. If you're going to do it, let's do it big time. And the decision was made, obviously, to fly eastbound because you'd get a tailwind. And the tailwind would be 6% of our distance is how we originally calculated it. And we decided to go in the month of October and November. It was November in the end because that's when you get the best winds across the Pacific. And that would be the largest amount of our distance. You can see that's why we went up. Uh, so far north rather than just coming straight across was to get a really good distance leg. It was anticipated that the flight would take about 23 hours and the airplane normally cruises at Mach 0.84 but we decided to cruise at 8.3 because we wanted a minimum fuel burn. We weren't going for speed, we were going for distance and the thing we didn't want to have happen, we knew there were a couple places the uh, flying would be a little turbulent and we didn't want the, the throttles hunting and seeking for the power so we decided 0.83 that would minimize that. That was one of the biggest discussions with the aero department. So our initial, cruise, our initial cruising altitude was 29,000 feet and we kept stepping up, uh, taking advantage of the winds as we lightened up and we stepped up to 41,000 feet. And for those of you who know the 777, you know she can go to 43,000 feet. We didn't go that high because the winds weren't as good as 43,000 feet. And we were fortunate enough to have purchased Jeppesen and we had a guy in Jeppesen in San Jose in his sleeping bag sleeping uh, on the floor. Uh, he was great to do that, giving us wind reports every hour so we could take great advantage of the winds. Our takeoff weight was 711,000 pounds and we had 360,000 pounds of fuel. And we filled, uh, normally you fill the tanks up to what's called a volumetric shutoff point. And you do that, there's a 2% more volume of fuel that you can put in. But that's so if the fuel warms up and expands, it won't port overboard. Well, that was 2% more fuel, so we filled up that area as well. And we had three auxiliary tanks that we had been flight testing that had about an hour of fuel each because we were looking forward to the 777 freighter and we thought if somebody wants to go ultra long haul, we can offer three more hours of fuel. So we happen to have those as well. So lots of fuel. So there are three things you consider for a record. They would be weight, fuel density, and wind. So we'll, we'll do a little, a little math here. I'm sure it's obvious, but the lighter you are, the further you fly, right? Because the less weight you have to move. And in numbers, for every thousand pounds you can save, and our max takeoff gross weight, we could have gone 766,000 pounds. So for every thousand pounds you save, you can fly 20 more miles. So we took everything off the airplane uh, that marketing would not kill us over. Uh, so we took off a lot of galley inserts, ovens, chillers, coffee makers. We had one working galley um, on the flight. We calculated how much water we needed because the 777 has a tank for almost 400 people for potable water and there were only 33 of us on board. And so one of our guys came up with the double flush calculation for which I was really um, leery to say the least at first. He said, you know, I, I think I've got this figured out. I was on a long flight and everybody that used the restroom flushed twice. So we'll figure out how many, I'll figure it out how many times everybody's going to go. We'll do a double flush and we'll add 10% and that's all the water we need. 
Well, he did such a great calculation, we went with it. So we saved a lot of weight not taking all that water, which is pretty heavy. The other thing I ask all the passengers, because we had a number of reporters, so I knew they'd have a lot of equipment, if everyone could keep down to 40 pounds for their luggage. And for some reason, everybody thought I was asking them to go on a diet. So we had one guy on the South Beach diet. Um, my favorite was we had one guy who went on the all beer diet. I think he had the best diet. Uh, the airplane was physically owned by Pakistan International Airlines. They called me from Karachi and said, Susanna, don't worry. It's Ramadan. We'll be very skinny. So we're, we're doing our best to help you on the weight. So I finally felt really guilted, and I went on a diet too. So everyone went on a diet, but that's not what we were asking. So fuel. Fuel obviously was a real biggie for us. The airplane normally holds 202,000 pounds of fuel, which is about the weight of two 737s, pretty fully loaded. And we had 360,000 pounds of fuel. But how to optimize that? So as I mentioned, we wanted to fill the fuel all the way up to the volumetric, past the volumetric shutoff, all the way up to the skin. So now remember, we're in the middle of a flight test program. Everyone's working 14 to 16 hour days. So the phone call, if you're the fuels guy you don't want to get, is from the chief pilot, who asks you without telling you why, because we didn't want to get scooped by our great competition on this record. So only maybe 10 people knew what our plan was. So I called the fuels guys and I said, hey, what do you think? Let's fill the fuel all the way up to the top. Do we have to do a flight test to do that? What are your thoughts? Well, they hung up on me. Um, <laughs> And uh, if I hadn't had such a great working relationship with them, I think they would have told me where to go and then hung up on me. So then I called up the arrow guy and said, uh, real casual, oh, by the way, you know, if we were to fill the tanks all the way up to the top, what body attitude would we need to fly? Because on the climate, if we we're too steep, we'd port fuel overboard. And obviously, you don't want to be too shallow because then you don't get up into the altitude that you want for the winds. Well, the arrow guys basically hung up on me too. So I thought, I'll give them a couple of weeks. I'll call them again. Well, in the meantime, they called each other. And they later told me uh, that the conversation went something like, she doesn't usually ask dumb questions like that. So she's up to something. What is she up to? And they kind of figured it out. And after that, they were totally on board. And they came up with really great ideas. So something to think about uh, about fuel is what I've listed here is fuel density. So not only do you want a lot of fuel, you want to put it everywhere you can, but you want the densest fuel possible. The denser the fuel, the better the burn, the further you fly. So there's a couple of ways to get dense fuel. One is to buy it. We couldn't figure out how to do that. We were going to put it in a 4.7 and tanker it to Hong Kong, then take it out of the belly of the 4.7 and put it on the 777. That, there was just all kinds of problems with that. Um, another way is to get the, coal, the fuel really cold. So the fuels guys, now they're with me. They're really with me. They say, Susanna, we've got this really great idea. And we're going to put the fuel in a tanker in Hong Kong. And we're going to get nitrogen. And we're going to put the nitrogen in the fuel tank. The fuel's going to get really cold. And it's going to get really dense. What do you think? And I said, no, no, no. Why not? I said, because I have this vision of that tanker with fuel you guys putting in a little too much nitrogen, something going wrong, it blowing up, and us getting kicked out of Hong Kong. So we're not going to do that. In the end, we got really lucky. I've always been a big believer that hard work and opportunity will collide. And that's what happened for us. So two things occurred. One was uh, Hong Kong puts an additive in their fuel. We didn't know that. And that gives you a better burn. Nice, very nice. And the other was we had a cold snap at Boeing Field. And the fuel at Boeing Field is in tanks that are underground. And so a third of the fuel we ended up on board, we ended up tankering ourselves. And it was very dense because it had gotten so cold. So we kind of made our own high density fuel in the end. The third thing is the wind. Obviously, this is the one you have the least control over because Mother Nature controls the whole thing. 
So statistically, as I said, the winds are the strongest in October and November. And for some reason, the mechanics decided that I had a hotline to the universe. And they came to me, and they asked me to start praying for tailwinds. So I thought I'd do anything to make them happy because they were the best guys ever to work with. And unusually, the wind started a month early and started blowing 200 knots across the Pacific, which were the tailwinds that we wanted. So of course, you know what happens. Now the mechanics come to me and say, Susanna, that was really nice, but could you do us a favor? Stop praying. You just did too good a job. <laughs> But, interestingly enough, those 200 knot tailwinds lasted the whole time until we got to Hong Kong. So we did have 200 knot tailwinds going across the Pacific. When we hit the US, we hit a second jet stream. When we hit the Atlantic, we hit a third jet stream. So not only did we significantly smash the record, but we ended up with a speed record across the United States and a speed record across the Atlantic that we had not counted on. So to tell you a little bit about what it was like sitting in the flight deck of the 777 in Hong Kong, it's about 9.30 at night. And there are some things, no matter how old you are, that are, I think, forever impressed on your memory. And I look out the window uh, at the airport, and it is like a beehive. There are airplanes everywhere. And we have one hour to go. We have everybody on board. We have some really high-end reporters, CNN, BBC. Uh, oh my gosh, who, who didn't we have? And uh, 10.30 to me wasn't 10.29, it wasn't 10.31, it was 10.30, and I'm thinking, you're going to be lucky if you get out of here at all tonight because the airport was so busy. And I think it, that whole thing for me was a huge life's lesson because the next thing I thought to myself, you have the best crew in the world, crew of 70 people. They've worked for months. Nobody slept. They were out at the airplane at 8 o'clock this morning. They had a plan Pat went approved of. It was in five minute increments to move the airplane, fuel the airplane, cater the airplane, weigh everything that went on the airplane. They'd done it all. And I thought, Susanna, what you have to do now is trust. Everything's been done and let go and trust it's all going to work. So about 10 o'clock, uh, the air traffic controller called us and said, will you give me a 10 minute heads up when you want to start engines? Well, for those of you that fly, the you know the controller never calls you and asks you this. So it's like, okay. So we did some math and figured out from 10.30 and worked it backwards. And 10 minutes before we wanted to start the engine, uh, we called her and said we're, we're ready to start. Uh, she told us to start the engines. We started the first engine. She said we were cleared to taxi. I look out the window and there is nothing moving on the Hong Kong airport. In fact, one of our colleagues was in one of the lounges and he said he thought there was a terrorist attack because all of a sudden it was like the Hong Kong airport stopped. And he said, ah. And then he saw one taxi light come out, come onto the runway, which he knew was us. So she cleared us to taxi. As we started the taxi, she cleared us for takeoff. We started the takeoff roll and we rotated exactly at 10.30 at night and literally after that we could do no wrong. So for me, uh, because I was the team leader, I would say it probably wasn't until about eight hours into the flight, as General Daly mentioned, there were eight pilots total. We flew in four hour blocks. Um, I could have had a lot more pilots. We were the hottest ticket in town. Everybody wanted to go on the flight. But we had a four hour rotation. In about eight hours, I was up in our fabulous crew rest. I'm laying there and I'm thinking, the spa queen has behaved herself for the first eight hours. Will she behave herself for 15 more, please? And um, I finally, I think I got quiet enough and I realized that the airplane had settled into the jet stream and it was like sailing. We literally were just scooching along. We had this, you can imagine what our ground speed was. We were just under uh, 700 miles an hour. We were really zinging along really quick. And the airplane, being true to her name, uh, she was a lot like a racehorse. And you know how racehorses, when they smell the finish line, how their neck goes out and they go for it? And that's how the airplane felt. And that's when I knew we really were going to make it. 
very confident we were going to make it. So here's the statistics for the flight. As I said, our takeoff weight was 711,000 pounds. Uh, our max gross weight is 766, so 55,000 pound diet, not bad. Our fuel, 360,000 pounds, so over half of our weight was fuel. Our takeoff time being 10.30. Our landing time in London was a little after 1 o'clock in the afternoon. Our total time was 22 hours and 42 minutes, so we were off 18 minutes in our estimate. Our total distance was 11,664 nautical miles. And we beat the previous record by over 2,400 nautical miles, or almost 22%. You need 2% to break the record, so as we said, we, we sort of overachieved, but it made us very happy. So uh, to tell you a few stories about what happened on the flight, so the air traffic controller somewhere around the East Coast, uh, by then our strip had timed out, you couldn't see what our takeoff airport was anymore. So the air traffic controller, you know, it's the middle of the night, is a little chatty and says, oh, I can't see where you took off from. Uh, where was your airport of origin? And the person flying said Hong Kong. And the controller said Hong Kong, Ohio. <laughs> and we said no, no, that would have been Hong Kong, China. It got real quiet. I, I really do not think the controller believed us. Uh, the other thing I mentioned, we had a lot of reporters on board. And are any of you familiar with Richard Quest? I know you are. From CNN, aviation reporter. He's fabulous, but when he reports, he is larger than life. So we had telephones on board the airplane. Now, you don't, be, don't be going on your next flight saying Susanna said this was okay. So we had done flight testing for cell phones, and we'd gotten special permission to use them on this flight with the FCC and a bunch of other people. So every hour, Richard, to millions of people, would have this phone conversation that was on CNN. And Richard, like I said, is larger than life, and so I don't hit that, he'd go, Captain, where are we? And we had, uh, honest, a beach ball blow up globe, and we'd show Richard where we were. Um, so my one colleague was the, the newest kind of kid on board, and he was very nervous. He'd never been interviewed by a reporter before, and when Richard came up and said, Captain, where are we? He kind of froze, and he had started, of all people, his life as a navigator. What he meant to say is we were just coming off the East Coast over the Atlantic that we'd coasted out, would be the correct terminology, and instead Rod said, Richard, we've just all passed out over the Atlantic. <laughs> You've, you've got to know he got teased about that for a long time. Uh, the next thing, we, we get into London, and uh, of course, you typically have to hold in London. The air traffic controller is apologizing to us. He, too, doesn't know where we started from. And he's saying to my boss, who is now in the seat, he and the customer are going to do in the landing, and I'm in the jump seat. And uh, he's <laughs> the controller says, Oh, uh, will you guys really be upset if I make you hold 10 or 20 minutes? And uh, my big boss says, no, no problem. We've been flying for a while. We can handle another 10 to 20 minutes. So with that, uh, we held. But my favorite was when I changed jobs to become the chief pilot of flight services, which as uh, we said earlier, we did all the training globally. We had training centers all over the world, as well as pilots that did training in the airplanes for our airline customers. And when I started, uh, the group had been a subsidiary and they were coming back underneath Boeing. So I invited all of our managers, who I knew nobody, uh, into Seattle from around the globe so that we could make a plan. Typical Boeing thing, we're going to make a plan, got, got charts and graphs all over the room, and uh, a couple of motivational speakers. It was all going to be good. So 33 of us, 35 of us are in the room. And uh, during a break, uh, our manager from Australia is talking about his record flight in a 747 400 from 1989. Well, we knew the captain, but we never knew who the other pilot was. So I thought, oh, there's the other guy. Fabulous. We can talk airplane stuff. What a great icebreaker. 
And then he says, yeah, I held the record for 16 years, and then some cheeky bugger in a 777 took my record away from me. <laughs> and the people who knew me, or knew of me, turned and they all look at me with this horrified look on their face. And so uh, Ray's looking at me like, what, what, what did I say? Was I rude? Did the word cheeky bugger hurt your feelings? What, what did I say? I thought, God, what do I say to this guy? So I said, Ray, they're all looking at you and me because I'm the cheeky bugger that took your record away. And you know, even when I retired, I think he still has not forgiven me for that particular thing. But I really did try to get him to forgive me. So before uh, I answer any questions tonight, I thought I'd show you what some of the media was. We thought we might get a little recognition in the press because for us it was a once of a lifetime experience. What we didn't expect is it really would hit the aviation press big time and computers and the internet which were new to us we were told to Google which was like Google what the heck is Google in 2005 and when we googled the record flight there were 777 hits initially so I'll show you uh, a little bit of that press but before I do um, a, a lot of people said to me so during all those months of planning how did you stay focused how did you keep the faith that was going to work because a lot of people said we were flipping crazy maybe some of my relatives as a matter of fact once it came out what we were going to do and I think coming from a goal-setting family from my grandparents and then setting my goals all along my career and just being focused on what I wanted to do and not worrying about the rest. Just thinking the rest is details. Just stay focused on your goals. This came down to doing the same thing. And so I hauled out my favorite poem by a poet named Goethe, which I've read in times I need inspiration or I think maybe I have lost my mind and what the heck am I doing this for? So Goethe says, until one is committed, there is hesitancy, the chance to draw back always in effectiveness. Concerning all acts of initiative and creation, there is one elementary truth, the ignorance of which kills countless ideas and splendid plans, that the moment one definitely commits oneself, then providence moves too. All sorts of things occur to help one that would have never otherwise occurred. A whole stream of events issues from the decision, raising in one's favor of unforeseen incidents and meetings and material assistance which no one would dream would come their way. Whatever you can do or dream, you can begin it. Boldness has genius, power, and magic in it. Begin it now. And here is the press. Will you bring up the house lights, please? And what questions can I answer? Thank you. <laughs> yes? How much fuel did you have left when you arrived in London? The question is, how much fuel did we have left when we arrived in London? We had an hour and a half's worth of fuel. And I would tell you there was a brief, very brief discussion about we could go to Paris. <laughs> Maybe we could land in our competition's backyard, but uh, all the media was waiting for us in London. And uh, we did have this really cool parking spot. We used the Queen's parking spot, so. So an hour and a half. Yes? <laughs> the question is, how many white knuckle flights did I have? Um, the reason I'm smiling, they actually would be fewer than you think. I think there was probably two times that stick out hugely in my memory of a career of 30 years flying uh, where I was startled and uh, for the, I know for those of you who pilots can relate to this, that's what you do all the training in the simulator for. I will say every time you're startled there are two words that flash across your brain. Uh, you look at the other guy, uh, he looks about like you do, which is no color, and then you say, okay, I'm over that, and now what do we need to do to keep our, keep our airplane flying? 
So, you know, every now and then in flight testing, I'll, I'll give you a couple of examples. Um, you saw the trailing cone on the 777-200LR. That gives you a great, uh, we, we let it out about 125 feet, so you have great static air, so you have very accurate airspeed. Every now and then we'd fling one of those off. You have to explain that to the FAA. Um, I've always said, you know, an anthropologist 100 years from now will dig those up, you know, be on top of a cow out in the eastern Washington and think it's some kind of weird ritual. Uh, I've left a few other parts here and there. Yeah, a few engines decided to get cranky and uh, liberate parts. That was one of my favorite expressions that someone else used. I didn't think that was quite accurate. But um, I would say, except for a couple of times where, you know, I went home and uh, had such an adrenaline hit, I needed to, you know, vacuum the house, weed the whole yard to get rid of the adrenaline. Uh, really, 99. something percent of the time, it went very smoothly. But it provided the spice to my career. Yes. That first flight, how did all the preparation and working with the engineers and the simulation time prepare you for how the airplane felt and behaved? That sort of. The question is, on the first flight of the 777, how did the preparation in the simulator with the engineers, et cetera, prepare us for how the airplane was going to feel? So we do a lot of prep work. Um, the, the videos you saw today make it all look easy because it's all pulled together. Um, so we actually, the pilots are part of the team from the beginning, which is great, part of the design team. So we see the airplane as she's coming off the drawing board. Uh, we're in the meetings, and when somebody had a pilot question, would turn to us and say, okay, what do you guys think about this? Um, and, and one of the things I loved about the 777 on the original one, it says working together on the side, which I thought, yeah, whose slogan is that? It's really true. We all did work together, and we all relied on each other. So we went through the whole initial design process, and then you would go in the simulator, um, we had, actually it's called an engineering cab, it's like a full flight simulator except for it doesn't move. It has uh, visual on it, it has all the actual electronics that are on the airplane. And because the airplanes fly by wire, you've got a really good feel for the airplane during those engineering cab hours and hours and hours. Uh, that was really where y you paid uh, and I don't mean that negatively, but that was your price of entry for that beautiful 15 minutes around Mount Rainier. So we would spend hundreds of hours in the engineering cab. Then uh, our office, too, was great. We were up above the 777 floor, so we saw the airplane as she came through the factory, out into the flight line. We did a lot of the ground testing with the airplane out on the flight line. Then you start to taxi, you taxi slow and you keep working your way up to you're just below the takeoff speed. So you, it's, it's baby steps. And when you first start flying, you're flying right in the center of the envelope, not too fast, not too slow. You work your way a little slower, you work your way a little faster. With only two of you on board, and the engineers that you've worked with the whole time are in a telemetry room, and we're telemetrying all the data down to them. You do one point, they review the data, say you're either good to go or we don't like what we're seeing. Typically it was good to go, and then you'd move on to the next point. So you're, you're partnered. The engineers, uh, the mechanics, uh, everybody that brings it together, you're really partnered and you really rely on each other. And here again you trust. Everybody's done their job. They trust you, you trust them. And so back to your question about being white knuckled, I, I never worried when I flew because I was always confident everybody had done their job and they were hugely proud of the job they did. Does that answer your question? Okay. Yes? How long do you think this record will stand? The question is, how long do you think the record will stand? This year is uh, year number 11, and we're hoping to blow through 16. Uh, you know, but we'll see. We'll see. I, I'm thinking we're going to make it. But I'll exhale five years from now. Because otherwise I'll have to call the guy who called me the cheeky bugger and say, dang it, you beat us. <laughs> yes? Mm -hmm. 
uh, the question is on on the on carbon fiber or the wings in general. Carbon. Okay, uh, the question is, can you feel the motion for the ca carbon fiber wings for the 787? So I'm like the um, person of the, co the cobbler never has any shoes, so I sent my whole team to 87 school, so I didn't go. So the, the last in the history of our airplanes I flew was the 777. But I will say that airplanes do have a feel about them. And that's one thing for me, I can close my eyes and if I'm quiet, I can feel the airplane, I can smell the airplane, and she had a different feel going fast. Like when we go out to the dive speed of the airplane, if you go any faster, then you're going to lose parts that you never want to lose. That, that's a limitation, you can't go past the dive speed. But the airplane has a very specific sound and feel at the dive speed that's very different at a cruising speed, that's very different at a stall speed. So yes, even though it's a big baby, uh, definitely you can feel it and for a test pilot that's basically how where you start is how the airplane feels and if something feels off that's when you use your engineering degree to go back to okay it feels off it smells off something sounds off what is that system what components does that have and you start tracing it back to what your issue is yes Uh, the question is, did I ever watch the show Why Airplanes Crash? No. Uh, too close to the business? I, di I did not. Um, I was known as the bird strike queen for probably about three years and then someone took my title. I was very happy about that. I think I had eight bird strikes one year within a couple of months. Um, I always felt really bad for the bird. Um, the engines on the airplane, that's one of the certification tests they're done is launching a frozen bird uh, through the engine. You expect that everything's going to hold together. Um, you know, it, what I found was it just makes a mess and yeah, honest. Here's how the mechanics would clean the engine like this. I mean, you know, guys that have been to Vietnam and seen a lot of bad things, I mean, when you have a bird go through the engine, it is a mess and it doesn't smell very good either. Um, what you count on with the birds is that they will, you, d you don't move. Uh, what you're counting on, hoping, is that they will see you. So when it was bird season, I'd put on all the lights to make us the biggest visible bird in the pattern. Um, and you're hoping they'll tuck up their wings and that they'll drop and they'll miss you because you're not going to be able to avoid them. Uh, pitot tubes, I've had um, mud daubers. Uh, one time the airplane was in storage. We didn't realize we ended up with mud daubers in the pitot tube. Um, it, it was a little annoying uh, when things started just g going away in the flight deck and you go, okay, well, what do we have left? What do, what do we have left to fly on here? And we'll just go back, go back to our airport now. So I think one of the things that when you're a pilot, you have to expect the unexpected's going to happen, and uh, that you've, you know, that you're going to use your common sense, your logic, and your training to to piece it together. So no, I, I I'm sorry, I can't watch that show. Yes. We have uh, driverless cars, and we can land a un unpiloted airplane on the carrier. Do you think? Uh, The question is, uh, as the gentleman was saying, there are driverless cars, uh, there are pilotless airplanes that land on carriers. Do, what, what is the future and will we see pilotless airplanes in our, in our lifetime? Um, so I'm not going to tell you my vintage, although General Daly did tell you how many years I worked for Boeing. I started at three. Um, I, I don't know if it will be in our lifetime, although with the way technology is accelerating, I wouldn't be totally shocked, but I do think it's on the horizon someday. I'd be sad, you know, because it was a great job, but, but you have to move with the future. You've got to do it. Yes? 
Um, as a follow-on to that question, I'm not a pilot, but I have been an admirer of the 777 ever since its first landing at Washington Dulles from London Heathrow, I believe it was June of 1995. Mm -hmm. Maybe off on that day, but I went to go see it. I have gone on 777s for commercial trips. I've gone out of my way to be on a 777. It's an amazing aircraft. I really just want to thank you and your team for what um, what has become a mainstay of many of the uh, airlines. Mm -hmm. The question I had, which is the follow-on to this gentleman, is on a flight from Honolulu to LAX and landing in very dense fog, the pilot came on said you need to thank the engineers at Boeing because the plane just landed itself. If it was any other aircraft, we would have been diverted. And he was right, because we didn't even know we were on the ground until we were on the ground and we couldn't see anything. So there is some degree of automation already. Is that correct? Um, Yes. So the question is, and there was a prequel, and thank you for your kind comments about the 777 being a great airplane. I always said I really didn't, you know, I really didn't work for a living, and if the CEO realized he was like our daddy buying us fuel, we were all in trouble because it was such a pleasure to work on the airplane and to fly on the airplane. Um, and the comments about automation uh, already are, you know, we a big step there because airplanes can auto land in basically zero zero uh, weather. So if it's very foggy, you, you basically can't see out in front of you. Taxing the airplane is going to be the most difficult thing you're going to do. But uh, there is a lot of automation on the airplane. I said the 777 is fly-by-wire. Uh, earlier airplanes had fly-by-wire spoilers, so a computer was saying to the airplane, OK, this is what the pilot really wants you to do. Um, the 87 is even a larger step forward from there. And uh, the great thing about, we call them autolands. So you, all three autopilots are working. They're all voting together on how healthy the airplane is. And there's a lot of checks and balances. Uh, that are done, and you can land basically uh, where it's totally foggy. So yes, there's a lot of automation. But here's the question that we always thought about is, automation needs to buy its way onto an airplane. Because there's a lot of cool things you can put on an airplane. There was a lot of things we would have loved to have had. And that was one thing for us as pilots. We had to learn, OK, there's a business side to this too, and it has to balance out on the business side. So that's why we said automation has to buy its way onto the airplane. If it's safety, absolutely, we're going to put it on. But if it's a cool gadget, it's got to earn its way onto the airplane. So what do you really want the automation to do for the airplane? And to be particular about that. Yes? Uh, what are your thoughts about some of the recent accidents that involve like, lack of stick and rubber skills and how you can uh, get some better trained pilots uh, to kind of deal with this world of automation? So the question is, what do I think of the lack of stick and rudder skills for some pilots and how that's led to some accidents and how we're going to approach that? That was a big discussion in my last job. And so what you really hope to see is, you know, for all of us, it goes back to the basics and that pilots learn the basics really well. And so one of the things we're seeing with airlines, which I think is great, is the airlines are starting their own schools again. And so they're instilling great skills from the very beginning. And airline-like behavior and crew coordination with somebody who's starting on their first hour of flight time, which the military has done for a long time. So you want to build. You want to build your students up that way. Um, we, in training at the Boeing Company, have always been really big on stick and rudder skills because uh, the automation, uh, if it has a day that it decides to be cranky, you've got to know how to fly the airplane. So over half of the time that you're doing training, you're hand flying the airplane. And if your skills are rusty, you spend extra sessions until you were sped back up again. Did that answer your question? OK. Yes? Having personally flown the Airbus and Boeing aircraft, I kind of like the side stick. Do you see Boeing and Boeing that 
uh, the, the gentleman says he's flown both Boeing and Airbus. He personally lights the side stick. And do we see Boeing going that way? No. Uh, <laughs> I guess that's kind of a one-word answer, wasn't it? Uh, there was actually a big discussion on the 777 whether to go to a side stick controller or not. Um, and we said it you know, goes against tradition of what we've done, but we don't want to be stick in the muds. If it's the best thing, let's do it. And the customers that own the competition all said to us, nope. We like, we like your airplane just the way it is, and please stick with the control column, and we did. That was a huge customer input because we had seven airlines that worked with uh, 777 in the very beginning and defined what they wanted. Yes, the control wheel is smaller. Uh, the gear handle smaller. The flap handle smaller. They're more petite. They're actually, it's very ergonomic. Uh, there was a lot of uh, design intention for ergonomics. So what your hand feels, what your feet feel, all of that uh, was, there was some redesign in the 777 because of that. Yes? Thank you for asking. Uh, the, because a lot of people in here want to ask and they don't want to hurt my feelings. So the question is, what were some of the challenge of being the first woman that was a test pilot? So because of timing, I was the first woman in every job I held in the Boeing company. Okay? And one of the things I learned in the first job uh, was that for the first year you were on the outside of the door knocking and then one day it was like they took the family vote and you were on the inside looking back out and you didn't know how it happened but oh good lord it was so good to be on the inside looking out rather than the other way around. So one of the things I had to learn, uh, I think, uh, and no pilot is really great at, is patience. And also that when you're the first person doing a job, whether you're female, you're tall, you're short, you're green, you're blue, is everybody's going to sit back and wait to see what you're going to do. It's just human nature. And rather than being cranky or judgmental, just really focus on your job. Do your own personal best, just like an athlete and don't concern yourself about the rest and just make it through that first year. I'd say the challenge was uh, when I took the job, most people came from within the flight test department. I came from another department. So I, I didn't really feel the love on the first day. Uh, everyone was very polite. Everyone was very professional. I never had anyone be unprofessional toward me. But it was just saying to myself, okay, you don't have to bite off the whole chunk of a year. Just take a day at a time. And I'll give you a really great example of that. So um, when I finally progressed over to being I got to taxi the airplane. Uh, the, we drove our airplanes out of our parking spots rather than being pulled out and then they tugged us back into our parking spot. So the mechanic would be hooked up and would always say, um, have a safe flight and a great day. And I, you know, you'd say, okay, go ahead and disconnect. And they'd just go, yes ma'am, and walk away. It's like, oh, ouch. And the air traffic controller, when you signed off and you picked up the next frequency, to everyone else would say, have a great day. And to me, I'd get the frequency. So, you know, there were a few moments, it's like, wow, okay, I'm definitely, I'm definitely on the outside looking in. So one day, I'm in the airplane, I go to taxi out and tell the mechanic to disconnect, and it's that one year mark. Uh, he disconnects and says, have a safe flight, ma'am, and have a good day. And I thought, okay, here we go. This is better. And then off we take, you know, and we're doing our flight testing, and we'd switch off halfway through the flight. Each one of us would fly about half the flight. And uh, the air traffic controller, and you, we're such a small area, you knew everybody by voice. And I knew this was the guy I had to have on my side, that he'd crack the rest of them for me. And um, so go to sign off, and he says, and have a nice day, sir. And then he goes, I mean, ma'am. I mean, sir. I mean, ma'am. I mean, and he's like totally discombobulated himself. And of course, the guys with me are just like doubled over laughing. And he finally goes, oh, have a nice day, ma'am, sir, and you know what I mean. 
So my first nickname in the group was Mamser for about a year and a half. So uh, the other thing I throw in there with it is uh, my grandparents had a great sense of humor and I, th I think I inherited that from them is, is you have to know when to take something serious and address it and when just to you know laugh at yourself and g or give yourself a break. Okay. Yes. Oh, thank you. Uh, the gentleman uh, said he flew the 5767 and 777 and he loved the airplanes. Thank you. Because you're the person who really counts, not us Boeing pilots. Yes? The question is, do I fly general aviation airplanes? And I have not been. I have to admit, after 40 plus years of keeping a schedule that was rigorous, uh, the last year and a half I've been kind of like a surfboard without a surfboard. A friend calls up and says, you want to go to Amsterdam? Sure. What time do we leave? Um, but there is a float plane base up around uh, from my house, and I keep eyeing that. I have a couple hours, but that would be the next thing I'd like to do. And uh, I have to admit, I, I miss the flying. But as a pilot, you know, we all have a timestamp to do it professionally, so. So no airplane yet. Yes? I saw the movie Sully a few days ago. So as a pilot, what are your thoughts were on what he did? And what are your thoughts on how well Boeing's aircraft would hold up anything in the <laughs> The question is, <laughs> uh, my thoughts on uh, the incident that Captain Sully had and how well would a Boeing airplane land in a river. So all airplanes are designed to land on water, not purposefully, <laughs> not because you have no, only because you have no other option. Um, Obviously, this is not something you can flight test because you don't want to put an airplane in the water and see how long it's going to float. Um, I think what he did was absolutely amazing. It was great airmanship. It's one of those things you hope will never happen to you um, as a pilot because you only have a split second to make a decision. And, uh, and what's the right one? And uh, I would hope that a Boeing airplane would handle just as well uh, if it were in the river. And hats off to Airbus for the airplane doing that well. So. Any other questions I can answer? Okay, I would like to thank you all again for being so fabulous and for being here tonight. Thank you. Well, thank you, Susanna. That was a great uh, presentation, and uh, I agree that was a nice bookend to put with your first uh, yeah. visit here to the museum. So we're delighted to have you back, and we thank want to you. thank you for uh, your presentation. I want to thank the Boeing Company for making it possible because they let her come tonight, and like GE for getting those engines on that airplane. Did you notice the GE uh, logos on the, the, mm -hmm. the cells? Absolutely. So uh, we're having a great night here. The, uh, but thank all of you for being here. And we ask that you leave via the rear of the theater. And uh, there will be no book signing or any opportunity in the, the lobby tonight. So good night and thank you. <laughs>